Inside this video right here, we're gonna talk about exactly the different types of chest pain your patient might get on a patient assessment medical. Here we go. Hey, it's Evan, the paramedic coach here. I'm so excited to deliver this video to you. Before we get started, I got a lot to go over here about patient assessment medical and chest pain. Now here it is. You gotta hit that like button down below. Someone out there hit the like button on this video so that you got to see this video. That's how YouTube works. So hit the like button and spread the love to the other EMS brothers and sisters and hit that subscribe button so you can get more as well. Now here we go. What we're talking about here is chest pain for the medical patient. I got a list here, and stay at the end, I got a bonus, my hashtag bonus. You're gonna to wanna to stay to the end for that. Now here what we have is a patient. Our patient here has chest pain. Well, that's great, okay, we got that, but what might it be? And based on the other info that we get on our patients, how do we treat the patient and what do we think is going on? That's what we're gonna discuss right now. So you can get really good at this. Now the first thing is classic cardiac chest pain. So when we're talking about classic cardiac chest pain, let's define what that is. So what that is, is a crushing, a dull, like an elephant sitting on my chest. It's crushing, it's dull, it's achy pain. And it's going to be on the left side of the chest, or it could be globally around the chest, but the heart's more on the left side, okay? And we're gonna roll over the left arm, and we're gonna roll up the neck, left-sided, okay? Now the pain, when we're talking about classic cardiac pain, it comes on quick, it comes on quick. So it's not a gradual pain, it comes on fast, acutely, and they call 911, okay? Now what else might the patient have as far as symptoms? Well, here they are. Difficulty breathing, they don't have the energy enough because they're not getting enough oxygen to their heart, to move around. So they're not moving around, they're, they're weak, they're, they're, they can't move, they're, so they're very tired. Difficulty breathing, okay, they're having a hard time breathing. Now, the other thing, you might see nausea, vomiting, and back pain, back, upper shoulder blade pain, back pain, that is another sign and symptom of classic cardiac chest pain. And anybody, by the way, for the record here, anybody that has chest pain and calls on one, is getting a 12 weight EKG, period. Whether you're BLS and you're, and you're putting the stickers on and transmitting, or you're ALS and reading it, you're doing an EKG. At some point, whether it's a hospital or EMS, they're getting an EKG. That's classic cardiac chest pain. That's what it looks like. Now, one more thing I wanna tell you about you might need to know. Some buzzwords with classic cardiac chest pain is this. Your patients, okay, men feel pain more than females. Diabetics are sneaky and don't feel pain. So what are the actual risk factors of having a classic cardiac chest pain, a acute coronary syndrome, an attack on your coronary arteries because they're being blocked or squeezed? That's what this means, by the way, ACS. Here it is. Smoking, age greater than 40, 50, okay? Diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and a family history of having heart trouble or heart disease very young, like under 45, under 40. Now, ages can vary, that's my opinion, okay, on the age, but I wanna tell you that. Now, second piece here we're gonna move into is pulmonary embolism. Now, pulmonary embolism can be sneaky, and I'll tell you right now, we're talking about doctors and hospitals, pulmonary embolism is one of the sneakiest things, and it's very, very commonly missed for other things. So when they get treated in the hospital, what happens is they might say, all right, well, sir, it looks like you have pneumonia, and we're gonna send you home. But really, they have a pulmonary embolism and they missed it. So I'm telling you now, earlier in your career as you're watching this video, and you're a student right, probably watching this video, is you need to always think about pulmonary embolism when you get a chest pain. Now, what do they look like? Remember, a pulmonary embolism is a blockage in the pulmonary artery system, right? So that clot had to travel from the venous system, most commonly, I know this guy has no legs, but I have a leg, down here in the calf, and we're gonna roll up, okay? 
in our venous system. A DVT breaks off a piece of plaque, rolls up, hits my right atria, then the right ventricle. What's that to the right ventricle? The pulmonary artery tracks. Now, depending on what happens, if this patient here had sudden death, this patient here had sudden death, it'd probably be a massive pulmonary embolism. If this patient has tachycardia, difficulty breathing, chest pain, hypoxia, so they have a heart rate of, let's say, 120, and the room air set is 92%, and they're a smoker, maybe they're on birth control. Now, this is a gentleman here, he wouldn't be on birth control, but a female patient was on birth control, okay? It could be a cancer patient, any hypercoagulable state, right? And the final piece of pulmonary embolism is recent travel. So long plane rides, uh, long bus rides, long car rides, period of immobilization like bed rest. That's your risk factors for pulmonary embolism. Where the big key, it's chest pain. Maybe it, might, it could be clear or diminished lung sounds, high heart rate, low SpO2, that could be a sign of pulmonary embolism. Now, to go a step farther for my medics, I'll put on the screen here, remember your 12 lead EKG criteria, S1, Q3, T3. Let's move on. Hey, I really hope you're enjoying the video so far. We got a few more things to go over. I wanna let you know real quick, if you made it this far, the first link in the description is access to my life's work my video study course. I'll talk more about that later on, but I wanna let you know it's the first link in the description to get lifetime access to my best content. Back to the video. Now the third thing is pericarditis. Now with pericarditis, that's an inflammation around the heart, usually due to infection. That pericardium is inflamed, right? Cardiac tamponade is fluid. Trauma has the heart inflamed. Now with pericarditis, it's infection. So if our patient here had pericarditis, if we were to lean them back, they would be in immense pain. We sit them forward, man, they feel better. The pain is usually sharp and knife-like with pericarditis versus classic cardiac chest pain is crushing and dull. Now here's the big thing I'll put on the screen here. On 12 week EKG, you're gonna see, and you'll notice PR depression and a smiling upstroke you can see here. I'll, give you, I'll show you an example here on the screen of what I'm talking about. It's not that tombstone like you see with ACS. It's usually more of a smiling upstroke and watch out for widespread ST elevation and PR depression. There's your pericarditis. The other thing I'll add about pericarditis is this. They could have had a recent surgery and then that infection went to the heart. Another thing with pericarditis, just to throw it out there, is it's very, it could happen with IV drug use. Again, bacteria, when it gets in the blood, that can happen too. Just a quick tip. Now we have two more pieces where we're talking about chest pain. So next we have a medical pneumothorax. When would our patient here have a medical pneumothorax? Well, we know traumatic pneumothorax, stabbings, shootings, car accidents, different. A medical pneumothorax is most common in a young, tall, lanky individual. Okay, that's just the truth. That's what we were taught, and that's the truth. So if we have somebody here who's very tall, very skinny, very young, okay, let's go be in their um, 20s, for example, and they're very tall and they're very skinny, they could be at risk for a medical pneumothorax. That pain's gonna come on sharp, you can't breathe, right? We're gonna have diminished breath sound on one side, and maybe clear on the other. If it's really bad, we're gonna be diminished. JVD, tracheal deviation, those are your signs of a medical pneumothorax that's getting worse and worse. As those symptoms get worse, there's no reason why this can't turn into a tension pneumothorax over time. Most commonly, you're able to catch these because you'll have a patient that goes from, I'm fine, all of a sudden, boom, they're in a pneumothorax. They'll notice a pop. Whoa, what was that? It was a pneumothorax. Okay, makes sense? Let's move on to pneumonia, and then we got the bonus. Here we go. Now, moving on here to our pneumonia, which is number five, and then I'm gonna deliver you that bonus. Now, with pneumonia, the biggest thing that we gotta look at is we're coughing up green or yellow sputum with pneumonia, and pneumonia starts off with rails. Now, you could have bilateral pneumonia, right? 
So it could be bilateral rails is possible, but you're gonna get productive cough of green, yellow sputum, and you're gonna get a fever in your patient, and they may have some sort of illness diagnosed. That's pneumonia. Pneumonia is junk in the lungs, infection secretion in the lungs. That's why you get green or yellow sputum. It's an infection, right? Now, the big thing when we're talking about pneumonia is they have an infection. So if this patient had pneumonia, they probably would have elevated like I said, fever. We talked about elevation as far as um, heart rate, right? Respirations are probably going to be up. Now, they're going to start with rails, but then by the time we get to them, that's an early sign. More common mid-stage or late-stage pneumonia is going to be ronchi bilaterally in this patient. Ronchi, okay? Now, when I say bilaterally versus unilaterally, very important. You can have a bilateral pneumonia, but most commonly pneumonia is on one side, it's unilaterally. I just wanna let you know, it is possible to have bilateral pneumonia, but it's more common to get it on one side. I want it could be the side too, but just wanna let you know about that. So don't be surprised if someone has a bilateral pneumonia, it's possible, but most commonly you have one-sided rails or one-sided ronchi. There it is, let's get in to our bonus. Now, as a bonus, I want to remind you of something that I hear a lot about and people forget, so I want to give you a quick tip. Here it is. Could anaphylaxis have chest pain? Yes. But what else is anaphylaxis going to have? It could have chest pain. Why does the anaphylaxis have chest pain? Because their lungs are so tight because they're wheezing. They cannot breathe. It causes a pain. They also, in anaphylaxis, can have strider. Also could have knowledge of vomiting and also can have hives. So anaphylaxis, hives, nausea, vomiting, chest pain, difficulty breathing. That is anaphylaxis. There it is. My friends, I hope this video helped you get a grasp when we're talking about chest pain patients. There's so many more emergencies, complaints that you will encounter and you need to understand to pass school and NREMT, but more than that, even to be great and confident out on the road. So what I've done, my life's work, I'll put on the screen here, I've put together a 400 plus video vault of my best content, anatomy and physiology, on the job tips, NREMT prep. This is what I give to my students for NREMT prep at every level, EMT, advanced EMT, paramedic, basic stuff like blood pressures, all the way up to a video on ventilators, uh, when we're talking about medics, right? It's all in there, even medications, EMS meds, prescription meds. It's my life's work. I want you to understand this cold and get lifetime access right now. The link is the first link in the description, prepareforems.com. My friends, I will see you inside. Welcome aboard, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Waste, don't waste any time. Don't don't be hesitant and just do it because I know this program works. And I know it's it got me to where I was, where it's been a year without school from EMT to, hey, I passed my test in 70 questions. Like, go for it. You could do it. Like, do not hesitate and don't waste any time. People that don't know you, they need to they need this program. This program is not a, a choice. To me, this program is a have to. It take uh, uh, thousands and thousands of pages in the books and you just narrow it down and just make everything simple to pass the registry. So uh, it's, it's, it's great content, man. I promise you it's worth it. Took this with three weeks left to go in my class and I just, I'm not sure if I would have been able to pass my course or the NREMT first try without this course. The fact like when I was taking the, the national, and I would read the question and I, I would be like, whoa, Evan literally just went over this in the car. So it's, it really, it helps. I got to the point where I was just ready to spill all my knowledge onto this freaking test. So I'm like, you know what, man, just go ahead, go for it. Open it up, boom, congratulations, you passed. It was um, outside of having my children, man, it's probably the, like the happiest day of my life, bro, to be honest with you.